welcome to this uh, uh, medi classes grand round on primary amenorrhea and this is going to be a very interactive and interesting webinar in which we'll talk about four very interesting cases of girls who presented with amenorrhea and where we found to have a lot of issues in terms of assessment and diagnosis we are really happy to have two of our colleagues who have joined from across the country dr sekhar is there who is a practicing endocrinologist uh, at rajmundri and he is working in the medical college dr sekhar welcome uh, on board and good afternoon, uh, sir. good afternoon and he'll be presenting about a very very interesting case then we have got dr guru prasad who is uh, part of the medi classes course and program as well and he is practicing as a endocrinologist at uh, bangalore dr guru prasad uh, welcome to the program yes sir so uh, we'll start off a bit with regards to the initial aspects of what is the common causes of primary amenorrhea particularly with the angle of what we are discussing today about tall girls with amenorrhea then we will use those four cases to see how these practical assessment tips will help out and all of these cases have quite unique issues which are there in terms of diagnosis and management which we'll be covering from that perspective so we'll start off first of all as to why it is important to evaluate for amenorrhea and what can be significant implications which can happen in that perspective so uh, i hope the slide is visible now so this is a 17 year old girl with primary amenorrhea who presented to us with stage 4 breast development and also at pubic hole development and there was no menstrual cycle so there was a normal development otherwise but there was no periods basically she was a tall girl now this is a common concept which we'll talk about all the four individuals we'll talk today were those who were either tall or had the potential to be tall in that their bone ages were open and they had a delayed bone age in that perspective it was found that the fsh level was high lh was high and estradiol was low so our diagnosis was established basically of a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and started on routine replacement therapy now what happened on follow up was a bit uh, uh depressing that the child actually developed a gonadoblastoma and that was because a proper karyotype assessment was not done and when we checked the karyotype it was actually a xy phenotype so it gives a big message that even if we have a classical feature of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism we should look at karyotype we have said that even if you have a child who looks entirely like turner syndrome even then karyotype is important because you may have a y cell line but if somebody is tall then of course you want to talk about situation where you need to be very very cautious in terms of assessment so the theme today is about primary amenorrhea particularly because of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and tall individuals so this basically brings us to a very narrow group but a very important group of individuals who present to us with implications now if we talk about primary amenorrhea it's there around 2.5% of cases most of them would be physiological or functional in that perspective but still there would be a significant number of pathology which we need to evaluate therefore there is a need for meticulous evaluation in that perspective you all can go and have a look at our website learning.grossociety.in where there are a lot of resources about pediatric endocrinology are available many of our courses are available in the form of fellowship and diploma programs especially also for gynecologist as well as adolescent physicians we routinely run three programs of pg lecture series and two grand rounds for the pediatric endocrinologist as well as pediatricians and we have got publications which can be accessed both online as well as the hard copy and our mobile application which helps making diagnosis very easy in that perspective so the agenda for today is that we'll talk about four specific cases in a scenario where we have a girl who has amenorrhea with high estrogen the second would be low estrogen and high androgen a interesting case scenario the third would be the issues with regards to whether there's a problem in the structure or the function and then finally whether the gonad or the enzyme is defective so these are four very interesting cases all have common of having primary amenorrhea in a relatively tall girl with hypergonadotropic hypogonadism so before we go that we need to just have a touch base about pathophysiology of uh, uh, primary amenorrhea so in that regards we all know that there are four organs which are going to play a role the hypothalamus pituitary as a unit the ovaries and the uterus so all of them have to work in tandem to ensure that the periods happen so we know that gnrh is a primary regulator of the gonadotrophins which then synergistically add on the ovary so lh acts on the lh receptor on theca cells to produce androstenedione 
while FSH acts on the, uh, the follicular, the granulosa cell largely to produce aromatase to produce estradiol. Now, both of them are synergistically required. What's important to understand is that in boys, LH is more important as compared to FSH. In girls, FSH is more important than LH. So abnormalities, isolated abnormalities in FSH or FSH receptor will cause a complete delayed puberty, no development and primary amenorrhea because you will have nothing, no follicle, nothing will develop. But abnormalities in the LH pathway, isolated LH defects, or if you have a LH resistance, will not cause primary amenorrhea. They will produce more like anovulatory feedings, findings in that perspective. If you put in the opposite perspective in boys, if you talk about abnormalities which are there with regards to the LH, you will have no pubertal development. So LHCG receptor defect, as we talk about present to us with atypical genitalia, so very, very early and severe defect. FSH abnormalities will not have that much problem. You may actually have a high level of androgens, but the spermatogenesis may be defective. So just to put things in perspective, if you have abnormality in FSH, isolated abnormalities, you will have significant delayed puberty and primary amenorrhea. LH abnormalities may not cause that. Of course, GnRH and those problems will cause primary amenorrhea and delayed puberty. We'll not focus that much on those groups today. Now, this estradiol is then converted uh, via from androstenedion via aromatase. So, if you have an aromatase defect, you will have a sort of a situation in which androgens are high and estrogen are low. So, the presentation in that scenario will typically be a child who has got some virilization at birth. Atypical genitalia will be there. The mother will also give you a history of hirsutism or virilization during pregnancy. And then things remain silent and then later on they will present with estrogen deficiency in the form of delayed bone age and primary amenorrhea with delayed pubertal development. Of course, estradiol has to work on the estrogen receptor and if there are estrogen receptor problems, you will again have problems which are associated with isolated abnormalities with regards. So if you have no estrogen action, the child will be born with a normal genitalia because the default mode of development is a normal female. So zero estrogen, zero estrogen action, normal female development will happen. Subsequent to that, the presentation will be delayed puberty, no breast development, and you will also have a problem in terms of amenorrhea. Now remember, because androgens are acting here, so your adrenal androgens are active, so therefore you will have a pubarchy, which will happen in this scenario. So what I'm trying to do is to link up all this pathophysiology to clinical pointer, which will help us reach a diagnosis in that perspective. Again, because estrogen is the major regulator of epiphyseal fusion, you will have a delayed bone age in that perspective. Of course, if you have a problem in the development of the uterus, particularly in the Mullerian structure, the upper two thirds of the uterine, the vagina and the uterine development, you will have amenorrhea. These individuals will have normal breast development normal pubic hair development, and they will have amenorrhea. So if you want to just assess clinically a girl who presents you with primary amenorrhea, you have to look at three major things. What is the height? What is the breast development? What is the pubic hair development? And our algorithm will largely base upon this in that perspective. So abnormalities in the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, that will be classical delayed puberty, of course, you will have no development in that perspective. You may have pubarchy in this scenario because adrenal production is there. However, if you have a multiple predatory hormone deficiency, you will also not have pubarchy. So pubic hair development is very important. Ovarian abnormalities like gonadal dysgenesis, the classical example being Turner syndrome with short stature, but many of the XYDSD. So as discussed, XYDSD is basically an act of omission, while XXDSD is an act of commission. So something extra has to be done. So XYDSD, any of the genes which are defective, they do not develop into testis. You will have a normal female development, which will happen. This will be associated with tall stature. As discussed, if you have a receptor problem, particularly the FSH receptor problem, you will have much more problems in terms of pubertal development. Abnormalities in aromatase will cause atypical genitalia at birth, followed by primary amenorrhea subsequently. 
If you have problem in the estrogen receptor, you will have pretty much a child who is a tall individual who has got reasonably high or an inappropriately normal level of estradiol. And then, of course, you have the structural defect. So primary amenorrhea can be because of a structural defect like a Mullerian abnormality or rarely imperforate hymen. You know, that is something which is easy to identify but often missed. So if you have a young girl who presents to you with acute abdomen, abdominal pain, and you find an abdominal lump, look at the breast development and ask whether there is a bleeding which has happened earlier or not. So this is a cryptomenorrhea, an easy diagnosis to make, but it is often missed. Otherwise, structural defects will have a normal breast development and a normal pubic hair development. Then if you have a functional defect, that means that you don't have a production of estrogen, you typically, you have either too little estrogen or too much androgen. So if there is androgen excess, also you can have primary amenorrhea. And this can happen in the setting of PCOS and CAH and you will have hirsutism. Then if you have an impaired estrogen effect where you will have no thilarchy because there is no estrogen in that perspective. This can be because of resistance, which is estrogen receptor defect, where your estrogen levels will be relatively high or you have a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism central cause, or you have a high FSH, which is a hypergonadotropic hypergonadism. High FSH can be because of a XX DSD or a XY DSD. Remember, XY DSD can also have a similar manifestation if the testis is not developed, it's damaged, it's vanished. You may have a complete female appearance in that scenario. The characteristic feature here will be tall stature. So as I said, tall stature means you may have XY DSD as I discussed about the first case in that scenario. An interesting scenario is complete androgen insensitivity <laughs> syndrome, which may also present to you with a girl with primary amenorrhea who has got good breast development, but sparse pubic hair. So again, breast and pubic hair will give you the diagnosis in most scenario. And finally, you can have a biosynthetic defect so if there is a proximal biosynthetic defect like star or side chain cleavage, you may rarely have salt wasting, but you may also have non-classical forms in which they don't have salt wasting. 17 hydroxylase deficiency will have hypertension and aromatase will have hyperendogenism along with tall stature. So four groups of disorders which will cause tall stature include estrogen receptor defect, XYDST, aromatase and all these scenarios you need to be wary about in terms of assessment and diagnosis in that regards. So the key questions that a physician who is managing a child with primary amenorrhea has to answer is, is it amenorrhea? If it's amenorrhea, it's structural or functional and what's the cause? Now, amenorrhea is classically defined as no menarche within five years of onset of breast development. Or by 15 years of age, you do not have, you have to start evaluating and working. So don't do unnecessary workup if it is not required in that perspective. The next question is structural versus functional. And for this, you have to look at the breast and the pubic hair development. So if all the components of pubertal development is there and you have amenorrhea, you may have a structural defect. Rarely, this may happen in the setting of somebody who was doing well then develops an acquired cause of hormonism. So you may have a scenario in which somebody develops a brain tumor, somebody develops hyperprolactinemia, but usually you, if you look at breast and pubic hair, you will get the diagnosis. So this scenario, there is pubic hair development, but there is no breast development. It means there is a GnRH deficiency. So you have no estrogen production, no breast development, but because adrenals are working, this is GnRH deficiency, the adrenarchy is normal. If you have no breast, no pubic hair development, this could be a constitutional delay of puberty and growth, or it could be an illness or really a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, where also you can have a similar scenario. If you have a normal breast development with sparse pubic hair, you are usually with androgen insensitivity syndrome. And finally, if you have a normal breast development, normal pubic hair development and amenorrhea look for malformation and that becomes relevant from that perspective and these are very very important in that regards so if you want to differentiate now from a structural to a functional lesion 
in a girl who has got thylarchy and pubarchy with a normal estradiol, it's usually a structural defect. Go for imaging, go for other aspects in that perspective. While if there is a thylarchy which is absent, pubarchy is variable, you have to think whether there is a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in that regard. Now we know that this is a functional cause, not a structural cause. The next question is what is the cause? So the key things to look at examination include hirsutism. If you have a girl who had a normal breast development, normal pubic hair development, but has significant hirsutism, think that this could be PCOS. We have seen so many PCOS with primary amenorrhea as well. So this is something to look at. If, however, there is no hirsutism and no thylarchy, it means there is a complete hypogonadotropic hypogonadum. In this regard, if they are tall, think of a XY DSD or an estrogen receptor defect. If they have a normal breast development in sparse pubic hair, that is androgen insensitivity syndrome. If there is salt wasting as discussed, star hypertension, 17 hydroxylase and aromatase, again, hyperendogenism and tall stature, which will be there. So if you understand and look at the basic clinical parameters, you will identify these causes. So these are the various causes I've summarized. We'll go into individual aspects, which will help us reach the diagnosis. So most important is that usually, if somebody is not having periods, you expect the breast to be not there. But if there is a good breast development, you are dealing with either androgen insensitivity or hyperendogenism or structural defect. Easy to identify in that regard. Pubarchy, if it's absent, you are dealing with androgen insensitivity, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Basically, if it is a very severe growth problem, especially because of a, a systemic illness or a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. Hirsutism will indicate hyperendogenism and aromatase will also be a part of that differential. Now, very important, that's what the focus today is height. Everybody who comes to you with delayed puberty should be short. We say everybody with precautious puberty should be tall. If you have a short girl, think thyroid. Similarly here, if you have delayed puberty with tall stature, there is something wrong going on. You have to think of antigen insensitivity. Usually you're thinking of an XY individual. So AIS will come there. Any other XY DSD will come there and aromatase and ES1. So these are the four possible causes of tall stature with primary amenorrhea and we will be covering all four of them. So this is just a hint as to what cases we're going to talk about today. FSH usually will be high in most cases. If you have a low FSH, you're dealing with a central cause basically. And of course, estrogen will also give you a picture. If your estrogen is high and you have amenorrhea, your diagnosis is there of estrogen receptor resistance. So if you look at the breast development, the pubic hair development, the height, the hirsutism, FSH, you will get the diagnosis in most cases in that regards. And finally, to put it in perspective, if your breast development is not there, you're mostly dealing with the hypo or hypergonotropic hypogonadism. FSH is high. You have to work up for further. Estradiol is low. Look for gonadal dysgenesis. Very important. Do a cardiotype. If estrogen is high, you will think of estradiol resistance. If you have got low FSH, you are dealing basically with a case of uh, a problem of central cause, go for MRI. <clears throat> and if you have, on the other hand, a normal breast development and you have got no pubic hair, this is most likely androgen insensitivity, go for karyotype. If you have got good pubic hair development and hirsutism is there, work up for hyperendogenism. No hirsutism, look for structural defect. The key message is, no breast development, no periods, hypogonadotropic, hypo or hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Normal breast development without pubic hair, it is androgen insensitivity. Normal breast and pubic hair with hirsutism, PCOS. Normal breast and pubic hair without hirsutism, think of a structural defect. So, so we had Miss N presenting to us at 13 and a half years of age, who was born to a non consanguinously married couple, resident of Kolkata who first presented to us in December 2016 with chief complaint of delayed puberty in form of no breast development and no, no not attaining menarche, but having had a pubarchy. A very important history that the mother shared was uh, that at birth, the child was born with ambiguous genitalia 
in form of clitoromegaly with labioscrotal fusion and no palpable gonads. Thus, a diagnosis of XXDSD was made and child was evaluated for the same. On evaluation, she was found to have a karyotype of 46XX, 17 OHP was 25 nanogram per ml, which is borderline elevated. However, a serum electrolyte and BP was uh, recorded to be normal. Thus, a diagnosis of 21 hydroxylase deficiency uh, CAH was made. The child was started on hydrocortisone, clodrocortisone, and underwent clitoroplasty and vaginal dilatation. However, on serial follow-up, it was noticed that the 17 OHP levels remained in the normal range. The child continued to have normal electrolytes and blood pressure uh, mesh recordings. So the uh, practicing clinician tapered hydrocortisone level and uh, advised a genetic workup, which was negative for CH. The hydrocortisone was gradually tapered and stopped, and it was found that even after stopping hydrocortisone, 17 OHP levels remained within the normal range. Thus, this was definitely not CH that we were dealing with. Subsequently, as the child grew up, she presented with delayed puberty. Delayed puberty. She was worked up and found to have very low estrogen levels, thus she was started on estrogen, following which some breast development was seen. Now, at this stage, she presented to us. So we had a girl with XXDSD who was definitely not CH and now presenting with a delayed puberty. So what were we dealing with? So just let's go back to the, the, the initial history that's there. So you can continue. So we have a child who had uh, atypical genitalia at birth and XXDSD. Normally we say whenever XXDSD is diagnosed, we say it is a 21 hydroxyl deficiency. Now, what will be a pointer that this is unlikely to be 21 hydroxyl deficiency. One, of course, if it's a salt wasting form, you will have salt wasting, but anything else postnatally, which will tell you that this is not most likely CH. Uh, so again, what we need to look at is 25, uh, 70 OHP level of 25 is very less. Uh, 21 hydroxyl deficiency will usually have something more than 100 in that range. Um, the other important thing would be whether there is a postnatal worsening of the atypical genitalia, whether the clitoromegaly is increasing or it's regressing. So if you have a scenario which is increasing, mean there is a postnatal androgen excess which is going on. Mm -hmm. But there could be other scenarios in which you only had during the antenatal period. And after birth, that scenario goes off. So suppose you have a girl who comes to you at three months of age, let's say, with, who was born with atypical genitalia, but the parents give you a clear-cut history that there is no increase in the phallic size since then it's unlikely to be 21 hydroxylase. What are you looking at in that scenario? You're looking at a girl who had antenatal androgen excess, yes. but postnatally there is no androgen excess. What do you think is happening? So there was something that happening in the uh, antenatal period where mother's uh, hormones were basically converted to, like were not getting okay. adequately converted. So one converted thing you were saying is that your mother's hormones were going inside the fetus and causing yes. a problem. The other thing is that the fetus also produces certain compounds which are converted to a hormone. So fetus is a big product producer of DHEAs. Yeah. And this DHEA is converted by the placental aromatase yes. into estrogen. Yes. So if you have aromatase deficiency, you will have a lot of production. But mm -hmm. postnatally, everything comes down so you don't have a worsening. So this would have been the other clue that postnatally there was no worsening in that regards. So now you can carry forward. You showed a scenario in which you had got androgen excess to begin with and now you have got estrogen deficiency so now i think like dr saker's case it was very very clear now what are you dealing with in this scenario yes so uh, let me just finish off with the examination her weight height and BM, bmi were essentially normal her smr her tanner staging on estrogen supplement was a b3 with uh, stage 4 pubic hair development bone age was significantly delayed at 10 years with chronological age of 13 and a half years on investigation, she had very high LHFSH levels with undetectable estradiol level and uh, very low AMH levels, suggesting a primary ovarian insufficiency. So how is it different from the previous case, if you go with mm -hmm. this finding? So estradiol is undetectable here. There, we had high FSH and a high... So that's estradiol. what I'm saying, that if you have no breast development, and even if you have good estrogen, it means there is a resistance. You don't need it to be yes. in a very thousand ranges. But here, clearly, you have an undetectable estradiol. Why do you think AMH is there? Um, <clears throat> what is the AMH marker of? Ovarian function. Ovarian function, largely the small or the mid-pool side function is determined by AMH. 
So do you think uh, your diagnosis, whatever you are thinking of, affects the AMS level as well? Uh, there is estrogen deficiency. So it, it will lead to, like, um, it will affect the ovarian reserve. Yes. So in... it's the, what basically happens is that androgens are bad for the oocyte. Yes. They don't allow the oocyte to grow up well. And estrogen protects the oocyte. So if you have anybody who has got antenatal or a long-standing estrogen deficiency, you will also have a oocyte damage. So that's why your image has gone down in this scenario. So we'll discuss about that later on. We'll carry forward. So with all this information, where do we stand? So if you go by the algorithmic approach of excess DSD, that is the primary pathology the child had come with. So uh, answering the question, the child had ambiguous genitalia. She had no palpable gonads. Malarian structures were visualized. 17 OHP level, although slightly elevated in the first visit, remained low always. So 17 OHP was negative. And she had normal BP records always. So the next question that was missed out was history of maternal virilization. When she came to us and when we went back into the history, we found that the mother classically gave history of second trimester uh, uh, hirsutism and change in uh, deepening of voice that had persisted since. So in our database, we have a child with XXDSD who had history of maternal virilization, presenting to us with delayed puberty, poor breast development and absent menarche, but presence of pubic hair and a delayed bone age on workup showing high FSH uh, LH levels and uh, very low estrogen levels. So this gives us the diagnosis of aromatase deficiency with primary ovarian insufficiency, which was confirmed on genetic evaluation. Targeted gene se sequencing revealed two novel heterozygous mutations, likely pathogenic variants in the aromatase gene. Thank you. So the take-home message here is, not every child with elevated 17 OHP level is CAH. An algorithmic approach to DSD prevents misdiagnosis. And in girls with aromatase deficiency, they usually present with atypical genitalia with history of maternal virilization. Pubertal development is often absent in such cases with delayed epiphyseal fusion, presence of ovarian cysts on ultrasound, and a continued growth into the second decade of life. Low estrogen and high androgen suggest this diagnosis, which is usually confirmed by genetic studies. I think that's a very nicely presented uh, by uh, Dhwani and it is very interesting scenario. So if you look at both the cases, these are rare scenarios. But if you carefully look at the history and examination, you will be able to make the diagnosis very clearly. So again, a girl with delayed puberty, she presented a bit early. The reason for that was that they were very concerned right from the birth. So if she had waited, it would have been more manifested features. But delayed bone age, around 3-4 years bone age delayed despite having given estrogen. So she was given some estrogen for some time. Otherwise, it would have been even worse. With a history of hyperendogenism at birth, along with estrogen deficiency later, clearly goes into your, your aromatase deficiency in that regard. She is now a, a young girl who is doing her graduation, in fact, completed her graduation, and on a, on a reasonable pubertal induction, responded very well, and she is having normal periods, normal breast development. And because we have suppressed the entire axis, she is not having hyperendogenism as well. Because if we don't suppress, whatever she will produce will again be androstenin ion and that will not be converted there. So again, a tall girl, normal pubic hair, no breast development, low estrogen with a DSD, think of an aromatase defect. So aromatase defect is clearly the one which is involved in conversion of androgen to androstenin ion to estradiol. To be more precise, the manifestations are mostly with maternal villilization, early onset and delayed puberty, and some milder forms may actually present with like a PCOS differential, but they will usually have a large ovarian cyst. You can go and have a look at our website, which gives you a lot of information about uh, these aspects. We'll address the questions as well. And you can also have a look at our program, which we do on a monthly basis, our publications, as well as the mobile application. Mm -hmm.